This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermin Sheikh. We look now at a new report published by the research group Forensic Architecture, which counters Israel's argument at the International Court of Justice that it followed humanitarian policies to safeguard civilian life in Gaza. South Africa argued in January before the ICJ that Israel was guilty of genocide during its war on Gaza. The report argues that what Israel says are humanitarian evacuations in Gaza actually amount to the forced displacement of Palestinians, which is a war crime. For more, we're joined in London by A.L. Weizmann, a British-Israeli architect born in Haifa. He's founder and director of Forensic Architecture, professor of spatial and visual cultures at Goldsmiths College at the University of London. He's the author of several books, including Hololand, Israel's Architecture of Occupation and the Least of All Possible Evils, A Short History of Humanitarian Violence. He's also a member of the Technology Advisory Board of the International Criminal Court and of the Center for Investigative Journalism. Al, welcome to Democracy Now! Um, as we come to air right now, um, the United States has presented a resolution to the U.N. Security Council for a temporary ceasefire. I'm wondering if you could respond to that. And um, Netanyahu only speaking with Republicans behind closed doors. Now we might be addressing a joint session of Congress, if the House Speaker decides to invite him, saying that Rafa invasion will happen. Yeah, if a Rafa invasion will happen, we will see the humanitarian disaster, the man-made humanitarian disaster imposed on Gaza, just aggravated uh, two levels that we haven't yet experienced. Uh, in Rafa, we have a huge part of the Palestinian people. Uh, evacuated to living in inhumane conditions where there are famine and lack of basic uh, humanitarian provisions uh, in something that is called a safe zone. And I think that it's important to understand that there is no safe place in Gaza, although Israel is designating part of the Strip as so-called safe areas and ordering the population to evacuate to them, it continuously imposes on these areas conditions that amount to unlivable conditions and in continuation of its genocidal policies. So what we need to, my comment to that is rather than uh, allowing any or entertaining any um, uh, specific plans and, and provisions, uh, you know, that the U.S. is discussing now with the Israelis about uh, allowing them to, to attack uh, Rafah under certain conditions, we need to see immediate ceasefire um, across, across the board in all places of Gaza uh, in order to allow for the rebuilding of the Strip, in order to allow for humanitarian provision to reach each and every Palestinian in the north and in the south. Well, Eyal Weizmann, uh, the proposal that the uh, U.S. has put forth—this uh, is before before we turn to your report—the uh, proposal that the U.S. has put forth uh, for a temporary ceasefire is uh, reportedly for the release of Israeli hostages and, and allowing more humanitarian aid into Gaza. You wrote in a piece—I want to ask you about a piece you wrote for the London Review of Books in November, in which you document the, the pieces. Uh, headlined uh, exchange rate, where you document the change uh, in Israel policy with respect to its hostages. So if you could talk about the way that that's played out, you wrote the piece in November, if you could talk about the way that's played out and how you think that might affect uh, uh, what happens now going uh, uh, forward with respect to the hundred or so hostages who remain, who are uh, reportedly still alive. I think that what you see in all negotiations around the captives and the Palestinian prisoners sitting uh, in Israeli prison, uh, prison, some of them on administrative detentions without charge, uh, thousands of them, uh, is that Israel has been creating and enlarging its bank of prisoners in order to create, um, in order to allow it to uh, change the exchange rate. The title of that piece in the, in the LRB was exchange rate, and it was looking at the history 
of Palestinian resistance to Israeli occupation through the capture of captives from really from the uh, famous uh, airplane hijacks of the 70s all the way to the present. Uh, the way in which Palestinian forced Israel into the only way that Palestinian could actually affect and release their prisoners is through capturing Israeli captives. Over the years, the exchange rate has changed favorably to the Palestinians. And what you're seeing is that Israel is now arresting uh, people in order, Palestinians, uh, again, and holding them in administrative detention in order to beef up its bank of captives. More than that, you could see that in the reports on the negotiation, the fate of those people that have been purportedly evacuated into safe areas is being brought into the equation. One way of thinking about it is to say, of course, Hamas or Palestinian uh, fractions in Gaza are holding over 100 Israeli captives, and Israel is holding close to 2 million Palestinian captives. Uh, in And bargaining for their return home in exchange for its prisoners. And that is obviously patently illegal according to international law. And uh, the fact that even that is being brought into the negotiation testified that that was the intent of holding them away from their home as a bargaining chip um, towards that. So you have exchange rate now that is 200 million Palestinians displaced, uh, sorry, 2 million Palestinian displaced, 100 Israeli captives, and this is really where the negotiations are, are going. Eyal Weitzman, let's turn to your uh, report, the Forensic Architecture Report, which is headlined Humanitarian Violence in Gaza. If you could begin just by explaining the two words don't normally come together, humanitarian and violence. If you could explain what you mean by that. Of course, you've also written a book on this. And then uh, lay out the three phases of mass displacement that you document in the report. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we think about humanitarian principles, and part of them is international humanitarian law, so-called the laws of war, as being there to protect civilians. But a certain manipulation of international humanitarian law allows you to have operational advantage, or in this case, advantage in negotiation over the captives uh, in this particular way. So there is a principle, an accepted principle in international um, uh, in, in humanitarianism, that if you want to evacuate a population into a safe zone, that safe zone need to have several conditions. There need to be proper medical care, there need to be proper food and housing in these areas. Um, Israel has evacuated, ordered the evacuation of Palestinians from, uh, from within Gaza and from the north to the south into areas that were repeatedly under attack, into areas with no housing, no medical care, and now that we see no food, is being provided in it, so or very little or not sufficient uh, levels of aid within that. So that is firstly, um, you know, the kind of the principle of using a humanitarian principle that is purportedly used in order to save in order to, uh, to treat um, civilians and take them out of harm's way in order to achieve Israel's uh, operational objectives in this attack on Gaza, and that is to exercise pain on the civilian population to generate levels of destruction and harm that would deter Palestinians from uh, ongoing resistance to the Israeli occupation. And, and it's becoming more and more clear that the harm, that the levels of destruction that we're seeing, that the level of displacement that we're seeing are not the, the byproduct, are not the collateral effects of this conflict, but really the only thing that Israel has achieved during that war. It hasn't achieved any of its tactical 
um, aims. It hasn't dismantled Hamas as an operative force. It hasn't captured uh, the Hamas leadership. It hasn't freed hostages, except in very rare situation. What it has done is create an equation in which the civilian population is being put in harm's way uh, in order to bargain against their, their return back to the north, uh, to north of Gaza, um, in, in order to uh, effectively achieve uh, what tactically Israel has not achieved. So in relation to the stages, um, a week or so after the October 7th attack, uh, Israel is given the entirety of the north of Gaza an evacuation order. They were ordered to um, leave the north of Gaza, home to over a million Palestinians, the center uh, of Palestinian political, cultural, um, life uh, was was actually ordered to cross Wadi Gaza, which uh, divide, according to them, Gaza into north and south. That was the first stage, and uh, after the ceasefire, uh, the, the temporary ceasefire in which um, some prisoner exchange uh, was happening uh, at the beginning of December, what Israel has done is releasing an interactive map online dividing Gaza into a kind of a gerrymandered 623 zones. It was very difficult with people that we spoke to in Gaza to understand whether they are in zone number 546 or 547. The, 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 the map was extremely confusing. It was released online at a time of very frequent um, uh, internet and, and uh, power cuts, uh, or it was communicated via leaflets that were unevenly distributed. It was an incredibly confusing system that led to the ongoing displacement of Palestinians from one zone to the other. So when they were, after they were ordered to all move into southern Gaza from different parts in the southern part of Gaza, they were ordered to go into different places. And what the report is showing is the systematic and ongoing use of these evacuation orders were uh, meant to, um, to achieve that dis population displacement and, um, and that people were continuously being put in harm's way. The routes, the so-called safe routes along which Palestinians were ordered to evacuate, were attacked. Areas where they went to had no provisions and very often were attacked themselves. So we cannot see that humanitarian policy, so-called humanitarian policy of, of, the, of the Israeli forces. Um, and the argument that Israel has put forward in The Hague that, you know, they are not in violation of the Genocide Convention because they apply humanitarian principle, but we cannot see it as anything else but part of the genocidal campaign that is actually uh, afflicted on Palestinians in Gaza. And now, of, co now of course, um, if Netanyahu does succeed in a full-scale ground invasion of Rafah, they will go back. Uh, to all these places they were forced to flee. And they talk about, no worries, Palestinian civilians will be protected in these humanitarian zones. Um, El Weitzman, if you could respond to that. And also, just for people to understand, your organization is so unusual. And it also operates in several different countries. You yourself, born in Haifa. If you could explain how you do what you do, we are also showing a series of maps where you show the stages one, two, three. You've done so many different investigations from who killed uh, Shireen Abu Akhla, the great Al Jazeera Arabic reporter, when Israel was saying, caught in crossfire, you prove the opposite, she was killed by an Israeli sniper, among other things. Can you talk about what forensic architecture does and what you, as an Israeli British architect, are doing in this kind of analysis, an architect? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Of course, the, the nature of the Israeli occupation in Gaza, in the West Bank, and throughout Palestine, complete, uh, makes use of architecture as part of the violence applied on Palestinians. So 
starting from the location of settlements on hilltops in a way that divide the occupied territories, surveys it, bisect Palestinian built fabric, the design of roads, the provision of infrastructure. You could say that settler colonialism is architecturally enacted. In Gaza, obviously, we had the settlements in Gaza up until 2005 when they were evacuated. But after that, um, the Gaza envelope is a system of civilian and military infrastructure that included a number of fences and earth berms and military uh, facilities, and as well as kibbutzim and moshevim, these are agrarian settlements that are part of what Israel always called its regional defense. Of course, all that system was attacked uh, on October 7th. So you could see how architecture is mobilized as part of the system of control and occupation uh, of Palestinians. You could see why Palestinians would attack that system of infrastructure. And this is without commenting and, of course, um, not supporting the, the killing and abduction of civilians. But um, I think that architecture is a key part of that, of understanding uh, the conflict, the long history of Israel settler colonization, and also understanding what is happening in Gaza now. It is happening in urban environment, and one has to understand what this urban environment that has been uh, created over the years of, you know, since really the Gaza Strip was created as a historical anomaly. Uh, in 1948, when it was carved out as a kind of concentration area for refugees, becoming one of the densest part um, of the world, dense, most densely inhabited part of the world, how do you control population centers? And, and a lot of thinking was done from the Israeli side in terms of thinking about con the control of Palestinians as an urban problem. And what we see now happening in Gaza is the shaping of Gaza for, you know, the day after. Would it come now? Would it come in, in, in weeks, in months? We do not know. But what we see is Israel actually shaping the built fabric, destroying all homes and agricultural areas in a huge buffer zone along the border creating east-west routes, not only the famous one that we know around Dir al-Balah, but uh, all throughout that very long and thin strip of, uh, of territory, the Gaza Strip, we see it being uh, truncated, almost cut like salami, with, with routes and military infrastructure that would be there in order to isolate and divide different parts of the Gaza Strip if resistance continues. Uh, from the Palestinian uh, parts. And, and so architecture, if architecture is really the means by which Israel exercises control, we architects and the organization that I run, Forensic Architecture, is, you know, has many architects working with us, but also open source investigators, journalists, uh, 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 journalists, uh, lawyers, uh, etc. We are monitoring things from uh, a cartographic, spatial, and architectural perspective. We work very closely, and we have a partner organization in Ramallah, the Al Haq Forensic Architecture Unit, because we understand that uh, working in Palestine, like working anywhere else in the world, forensic architecture has also got offices in Mexico, in Bogota. Now we're starting one in Istanbul, in Athens, in many other places in the world. But Understanding the lived reality, understanding the way that architecture is used as an oppressive mechanism requires also the lived experience, understanding the lived experience of people there. And therefore, when we've done that report that you mentioned, we've been in touch with, we've been in touch with Palestinians on the ground, we've been in touch with uh, medical professionals, with doctors in understanding the conditions in the so-called safe zones. And as I say, there are no safe areas. Uh, in Gaza, we try to understand the spatial logic of that campaign. And we could see that one of the main strategic tools for Israel to, to control and afflict that pain on Gaza is, is through the evacuation orders and that they have been spatially 
designed initially, again, dividing North Gaza from South Gaza and then dividing it into 600 Tetris parts, if you like, in which you know you would get very confusing order in which your number would come up and you would be told to go from that number zone into another number zone. Um, do you get this message? Do you understand it? And also on the way you'd be attacked and the zone in which you're being evacuated to is itself unsafe and unlivable. So here what we see is the abuse of humanitarian principles to further Israeli genocidal campaign. And this is why we call that uh, report humanitarian violence. We need to be very, very wary when we are speaking about humanitarian principles in war, because very often uh, militaries, not only the Israeli militaries, but, you know, Western, Northern, um, global militaries from the global North, when they engage in urban warfare in, in parts of the global South, they are applying uh, humanitarian principles. Uh, they are playing international law in a particular way that does not contain violence that actually Amplifies. I'll give you another example for that. Um, warnings. When you know, you could think that um, to warn a population is actually something that could be very, uh, very helpful. It could, it could uh, save lives. But actually, the aims of these warnings, or what is implied in them, and sometimes explicitly mentioned, is that if you do not heed the warning, it would be considered. Uh, potentially part of the armed resistance in a particular area. That means you get redesignated from a protected civilian to a non-protected, either voluntary human shield or part of a resistance if you do not heed the warning. So in a sense, with one legal tool, you created a redesignation of, uh, of a big part of the population and you've let, basically let the, let the blood. Uh, in that way. So humanitarianism, when it, those principles, when they're using uh, in such a brutal campaign, they could be actually part of the problem rather than uh, something that is moderating and uh, defending civilians. Eyal Weizmann, if, if we could talk a little bit more about that, the scale, just to point out, just to give us a, a sense of the scale of the crisis of mass expulsions, uh, at the moment, almost 70 percent of the total area of the Gaza Strip has been <coughs> issued evacuation orders. If you could say very quickly, uh, in terms of the uh, International Court of Justice ruling, what does your report suggest about the defense that Israel presented? Yeah, that the defense is completely inapplicable. We will show how, and we have shown, how Israeli military, the occupation forces, when they maneuver through. If you look at things in relation to each other, if you look at military maneuver, you look at, at, at areas that have been bombed, as we have, through speaking to people, through analyzing videos, uh, through looking at satellite imagery, we have a good understanding, we have a good map of what are the areas that are being bombed, overlay that with the, the so-called safe zones, overlay them with Israeli military maneuver, and what you see is, A, civilians are being evacuated into areas that have been bombed, A, that have no facilities, and are continuously bombing, they are still being bombed as, civil, as Israel has ordered civilians into them. And you see, in some cases, Israeli military maneuver, Israeli invasion into the area it itself designated as safe zones. Um, so, in a sense, you see those categories operating in relation to each other as part of an overall strategy rather than you're seeing humanitarian principle pushing against military uh, violence and moderating it. You see, it has become one of the tools in the Israeli campaign toolbox uh, to generate that level of destruction in Gaza. So, you know, you're speaking about 70% of the areas being displaced. I only the, have the, 10 the, seconds. The proportion of people displaced is, is much higher, and the proportion of 
of civilian infrastructure destroyed is uh, almost complete. So look at those things together and understand the, uh, the militarization uh, of humanitarian principles. Hey, o. Weitzman, we clearly have so much to talk about. We'd like you to ask to stay, and we'll post part two online at democracynow.org. A.L. Weitzman is a British-Israeli architect, founder and director of Forensic Architecture. We'll link to the new report, Humanitarian Violence, Israel's Abuse of Preventive Measures in the 23-24 Genocidal Military Campaign Occupied Gaza Strip.